pleasure to introduce uh, Jonas Almeida. Uh, Jonas holds the position of Tenure Senior Investigator and Data Science Director at the National Cancer Institute in the Division of Cancer Epidemiology and Genetics. Uh, he maintains academic positions at the State University of New York, uh, Stony, uh, Stony Brook, Queen's University, Belfast, UK, and George Mason University in Virginia. He started in the University of Lisbon, uh, where he did a PhD in Biological Engineering in 95, and remained involved in collaborative initiatives towards artificial intelligence, cloud computing, and the development of consumer-facing polygenic risk calculators for precision prevention. You can find uh, in the links that we provided uh, more information about, about uh, Jonas. And uh, thank you so much for accepting uh, our invitation and uh, looking forward to your presentation. Thank you. So for the, let's make sure we all know this is very informal, so you're welcome to interrupt me, raise your hand, or not even raise your hand, just get in no comments. So uh, Susanna uh, told me I could talk about anything, and I chose a topic that Susanna classifies as archaeology. <laughs> yes. So we'll go back to the late 90s, and then we'll go all the way to language models. So for those who worry about the, the archaeology, we'll also find through the foundations to something that is happening now, which is the use of generative AI to analyze uh, sequences. So you may find this interesting. There was also a couple of other reasons why I chose this topic. One is that, as we now turn to uh, language models, it's important that the foundations are clear. And so then what you saw in, in ISMB last time is that the kids don't completely get it. I'm not sure if you remember the review session, and they were confusing something. So I thought, you know, before we move to language models, it would be nice to try to clarify the foundation and stuff. Uh, so the topic is universal sequence maps, and this idea from going from symbolic spaces to metric spaces, it says sequences to numbers and back again. And this is where the language model emerges. So language model basically is a function that given a memory of a number of sequences, so succession of symbolic units, will uh, generate the next one coming out. In a parent jelly sandwich, for example, sort of filling in the blanks. Behind this, there is a, a matrix of succession that can, does not have to be Markovian, and that is the, the B click. And it's a click that happened in the 90s before we were involved in the topic. And somehow it, it keeps being lost as we move forward. So I'll try to address this. And again, please interrupt me as we move forward. So um, I was very influenced by the work of Sidney Brenner. I met him twice. And the last time, oh, this is something he used to say, and this is recorded somewhere. So it's a real quote. Uh, the next slide is just something he said orally. And uh, what he says is that new techniques, new discoveries, and new ideas in this order usually lead to advancements in science. Not so much having an idea and then coming up with the technique is quite, quite helpful. So techniques open new windows. And uh, uh, he gave this presentation in Bangalore College of Medicine in Houston. And so he was quite told by then. I think this would be 2008, maybe. And uh, so he walked to the podium. Uh, the room was very quiet, completely packed, of course. And then he said, you know, I worked all my life with C. elegance and other things he's not for, in order to read the Book of Life. And then he had this Shakespearean actor style. He had this pause, a long book. It sounds like you've heard talking. <laughs> no, <laughs> but, uh, I know, of course, you have to change. <laughs> yeah, so, many, so it stops. And of course, the room was quiet, and for a good 30 seconds, which is a long time, he wouldn't say anything. And then he looked at his notes and started A, C, C, P, P, and on. So, the, basically, what he was saying is that this is the time that, thanks to our generation, you guys can read the Book of Life. I didn't know what this meant. I mean, it was at the time, okay, what, what does this mean? And I get to film with language models as of November 2022. We suddenly get a clue that is we can indeed model languages bottom up instead of top down. So, letting the AI start looking for patterns at multiple scales, at multiple succession orders. So it's not just one thing producing the next, but also producing the one after the next, or maybe jumping all over to the end and just predicting a few of them. This is an encoding technique, positional encoders, and it's something that is at the foundation of language model. So now we're going to walk slowly through the foundations, and when I get to the generative AI, I stop. OK, so let's start in the beginning. So this is 1990. I was not active. I think I just finished college. 
But I think Susanna was in high school, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> and so um, there was this paper came out and caused a lot of excitement because the 90s was the era of uh, uh, PPs and fractals and all these things. And so statistical mechanics were looking at chaos theory. So these things were happening, super exciting. And Jeffrey, I actually forgot his first name. Yeah. And you're Jeff, right? Jeff, Jeff. No, yes. never mind. So you'll have to check this. So in 1990, he started playing what's called a chaos game that was used to produce the space system triangle. So I'm going to go back to the paper. You recognize that papers written in the 90s, especially early 90s, don't have good PDFs. So the PDFs <laughs> are snapshots of someone's fax machine. So that explains the poor quality of the snapshot. So figure one, the result of the chaos game on three points. So the way you play the chaos game in order to generate the species in triangle is always go half the distance, at the edge you belong to, and then you have a sequence of edges, here you have one, two, three, and you have them in a random order. And then you just play the game, you go back and forth, up and down, up and down, jumping around, and you get this triangle. And he said, well, three is fun, but four will be more interesting because we have nucleotides in the genome. And especially at the time, this idea of a language was very inherent to the way biology was treating sequences. So you have the stock codons and also things that were hard coded in the genetic code. So it, it does this ACGT, that is ACGT, ACGU in this case. And so if you do this for, this was human chromosome, what is it, 11, I believe, you get this pattern. And at the time, the idea is that, okay, if we get this pattern, we are going to be in it, so transform this in frequencies, and uh, maybe we'll do something with this. Now, he himself, in the paper, is a short paper, it's three pages. He doesn't go very far, he just says, well, this lacks a mathematical characterization, it's time, I don't know what it means, but I'm intrigued by this, a one-to-one -one correspondence between the sub-sequences and anchored on the start. So you start the game by the middle of the fractal. Which it turns out is a bad idea, but for a while, maybe Susanna thinks, no, it's a great idea. <laughs> but I'll show you some examples where hopefully it's, it's a bad idea. Let's go here. So I was lucky because in 90 I was starting my PhD, I had no interest in, in sequence analysis. And like in 1993, in the same journal with the cancer research, another researcher, this was a, a statistician, uh, he basically said this was a funny field, this was typical of fractal stuff, that when they came out, people were you know, visually impressed, but then someone would complain that this is just an illusion for your eyes, it means nothing. And so the paper, that's what exactly what the, the paper says, that nucleotide, dinucleotide, and trinucleotide frequencies explain patterns in the chaos game. And the field falls completely. Not completely because some people who were not reading really literature, like the literature, the Rosanna Spitzer in Albert Einstein College of Medicine, that made the challenge of the kissing games. Don't you remember? We'll get to kissing. Uh, but so there was this idea people could not publish a topic where it's just an illusion for our eyes. And just recalling, so Jeffrey, uh, one on correspondence, not characterization, and Goldman. Patterns previously observed in a variety of DNA sequences are explained solely, that's the critical word, solely in terms of nucleotide, dinucleotide, and trinucleotide frequencies. Game over, I went back to my PhD and everybody was having fun. So in the late 80s, so early 80s, you have the algorithms. So Michael Waterman and um, Temple Smith, I don't know that one is first time. So the Smith Waterman algorithm came out, the needle and wound, all these things that we learned in our first class in bioinformatics, we were coming out and computational linguistics was at the time forming a sequence analysis. There was another school of thought that said aligning is not very useful, for example, for uh, evolutionary uh, studies, because it's mostly about the composition. It's the composition that is important. And you know, there are many places where this plays a role. For example, we know there is a GC virus, so the, the Two nucleotides have a frequency that tells us something about the restriction enzymes that are active to splice invading viral DNA. Just to pick an example. So we have evidence that there are things that touch at the level of the composition and not necessarily as a pattern. So a SNP, for example, would be something that would benefit from alignment and evolutionary patterns would follow up here. 
Mm -hmm. Anyone again, if anyone has any questions? So, so remember 1990, 93 is frozen, and I'll make a big jump forward. Uh, so this is the sort of books that were coming out at the time, influencing the new generation of researchers. I was very much part of this group. Those of you, I think everybody knows Benoit Mandelbrot. He gave a, uh, an interview before he, he passed away, where he explains that he was not well liked by his peers, and because they complained, he spent his time playing with printers. <laughs> and then, you know, he makes the argument that he's not playing with printers by telling us how he was playing with printers. It should have a really funny interview. In the end, you realize that they were both right. He was right for playing with printers. At the time, screens were not very good. And of course, his peers were also right that he was playing with digital representations. So, people in math working with freckles, typically, just in, in my, my experience, they typically approach it as an experimental science. They literally play with things, with printers or screens or whatever. And then they walk back and try to understand what could have been there that describes something, what properties are maximized by some fractal structure. So this is your paper, Susanna. This has been uh, cited now a thousand times. And uh, it also coined the name to this field. Can we approach this without alignment? So can we analyze sequences without alignment? Say, what's wrong with alignment? Well, there's a problem that it targets specific narrow patterns. And the second problem is that it's computationally uh, hard to scale. They scale with a big O of close to two, right? Or one point. Maybe I'll try to remember. <laughs> yeah, but it's actually BLAST, the papers that people were using at the time, when my informaticians were known as BLASTologists. <laughs> <laughs> so this uh, package, the first thing it did was do frequency counting to make sure it would select the sequences that were worth aligning. So even what, when doing alignment, in practice there's a first step that is alignment free. So this to say that this first period that goes uh, from 2001 to 2003 is work that happened in, in my group. And Susanna has a wonderful review, and I, I would recommend that you check it for this first period. What I'll do now, Susanna, is that ignore your work, walk back in time, and show you the, the moment where we thought Jeffrey had stumbled on something that really put the areas very well. So let's imagine we have a sequence. For each sequence, we have a CGT, so we have four possibilities. If we have two nucleotides, we now have that number multiplied by four, by four, by four, and so on. So the logarithm of four of the uh, full length of the E. coli genome, and I should have checked this, I forgot the length, I think about two million. Okay. I guess you can do the reverse uh, for race to 11.16. So what you find out here is that at the point where you have 11, so all possible combinations, let's say 12, so it has to be higher, otherwise you have some leftovers. So when you get to 12 combinations of four, you have as many beans as you have nucleotides in the Latino. Did you figure it out? No. <laughs> okay. So it's that part we have just here. So 444, four, four, I think it's expanded. And then you are looking at this sort of resolution for the beans. So it's perfectly doable. We can map a full genome into a bean space. It's no big deal, especially now with GPUs. Oh, okay. Um, I don't have the fully collect genome in this slide, just the threonine, threonine A. So there is the threonine opera in E. coli, has three genes, and the threonine. Threonine A is one of them. That's 2,463 uh, nucleotides. So I'm going to break them into four, depending, so I'm going to start with frequencies, depending on the nucleotides uh, that are counted. So there are 615 C, 692 guanines, five, 500, so on. So it's representing. So the GC content that microbiologists use all the time is the G plus C content. And in this case, it's close to 56, so half. So, yeah, and this is where it varies a lot between species because of this season so far on invasion. So, what I'm going to do now is that I'm going to represent frequencies not in the way people do it in the frequency approach, but in the way that comes back to us from the uh, chaos game representation. So, what I'm going to do is that I'm going to display them not in edges, but like this in the middle of a quadrant here middle of another quadrant, and each quadrant is divided again. So we have the reds, now you have the blues, and you have, you're going to have the blues for all of the reds. 
So it's killing me. Okay, it's a little bit clear. So, for example, if you want to measure the percentage of GC, so it's not the GC content, it's the GC content. <laughs> this is a, often a cause of confusion. So, this is of the dinucleotide. What you do is go, you go here, to, and you see here, and you divide by the total, and you find out it's 9%. So, GC, dinucleotide, is 9% of all the, the, the dinucleotides. And you can keep going on, so you can always, and so on. Now, what I'm doing here is actually repeating Goldman's paper, showing you that chaos and representation is pointless. So let's try to stretch this argument until the point it, it breaks. So Markov models, of course you all know this. We have this emission probability table. Often people like to see the table. So let's do it. So if you see A, there's a probability that no, then you see A again, or C, or G, or T, and set it for all the others, and this fraction equals to one when added together. You can also have, this is typical of the Markovian approach to sequence analysis, you can have hidden states, where each state has its own succession. So you can have a, something is going on in a gene, or in a part of the gene, where this is going on, and then there is an addition probability between states. Okay, yes. And you end up with a finite state of the model. So I'm going now back to playing with, with tables and numbers. So first state, second base. Again, we are back to the theory in a program uh, gene, which I'm constructed type. So, one after another, one after another after another. So, here I'm looking at trying to type frequencies to fill these probability tables. So, if I have A and then A and A again, the probability is 33% after A A. After A C, the probability of getting an A is 30%. And you see these numbers at one. Adults, no. And so this is the second introductory paper. So this is the analysis of genomic sequences by chaos and representation revisited in 2001. So this is a long time later. You know, this we are now an 11 year leap. Actually, we have 11 year leaps in Islam Bowser University in the use of fractal representations for sequence analysis. So what I'm going to do now is tell you what happened in 2001 that then led us to think, well, as the title of Susanna's review, that we can move to alignment free approaches to analyze sequences. And maybe you had enough time to read some of this. So succession scheme. So let's play the game now. So now instead of a triangle, we have a square, ACGT. We start in the middle. This is Jeffrey's original proposition. And you say, okay, let's just, so we're going to go start in the middle. The first one is an A, second one is a T, third one is a G, and what you see is that you always move half the distance to the edge. This number moving half can, could be another number, and you see situations later where for other alphabets, other numbers don't make sense. And then you fill your space. And the first thing you see is that there is structure there, I mean, there is no doubt. And if you have enough data, this structure will tell you something. Now, let's play the reverse rule. So, Jeffrey already suspected that there was a bijective map between a position in the map and the sequence. And what was becoming clear when you work on the decoding, excuse me, algorithms, by dividing things in quadrants and keep dividing them, keep dividing them, is that if you throw a dart at this unit square, you, no matter where the dart ends, you know it's a unique sequence and you can retrieve it by unpacking these quadrants. So, so far, so good, nothing special. So, all divided, divided in the middle, divided in the middle. So, let's do it. And this is again Goldman's argument that you're wasting my time because if I rearrange these numbers, they become frequencies in, in a Markov succession. So, there's a, a probability emission table, and that's all we need. So, now I'm going to go slowly. So, remember, I'm dividing everything by half. Okay, just remembering. So, Goldman is right. We have not left this domain. This is Markov succession. We're still there. See here, divided one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, and then one, two, one, two, right? In two, three, one. Okay, this is the, the step forward. So if you go from dividing this in consecutively in quadrants, you just divide, say, 10 by 10. So 8 by 8 has a length of 3, right? This is 10 by 10. So it's going to be more than three, but less than four. Sense. Okay. And you could say, well, I don't understand what I'm doing. Okay, so I'm going to go to the edges of each quadrant, and I'm going to play the division game and find out what sequence is associated with it. 
So this is basically useful to register sequences in some sort of memory at this point. You say, okay, so this is the number 3.32, more than 3 less than 4. So you maybe it all the way to 16, and you lost what's left here to be 4. Okay, and now we can go back to our frequency tables and start calculating funny things. Funny things means relationships that are based on a non-integer sequence or segment, which is weird. What is part of a nuclear time is not a physical quantity. So nuclear time now becomes kind of a unit. And you can go back in time. So he is just using standard multivariate statistical techniques, PCA, and cluster analysis, by going to these tables, right here and here. So the three genes of the three union operon, A, B, C, and this you have symmetric could be one minus the correlation coefficient to this, or could be a Euclidean distances, whatever. And you find out what you expect, the diagonal is zero, and you have a metric space. So it satisfies the three conditions. Uh, it's positive, it's the same value both ways, and satisfies triangular inequality. So A, B, B, C, A, B plus B, C is bigger or equal than A, C. And with these properties, you are rewarded with all the gifts that metric spaces give you. So this is not so much going from sequences to numbers, as it is going from sequences to metric spaces. Because it could replace, say, CGT by 1, 2, 3, 4, and have a long number. So now you have numbers, but it means nothing. There are no metric, there are no operations that you can have on that succession of numbers between 1 and 4. But there is here, so that's the model. And also, if you increase the number of quadrants, you gain resolution in, in evolutionary time. So, for instance, at the time, people were studying which gene in the theonine operon popped up first. This is common in operons. There's a gene, and then a copy of this gene spins out at some point, and then starts changing to code for something else. And then you quickly see that, yeah, this makes perfect sense. So green B is on its own here, where A and B are together. So you stand over and C, C and A together with each distance, and B like it. All right, so just recalling some properties of this funny space and the metrics that you can apply to it. So if you're in the middle, you can go to all these places, and they are all exactly at 0 0.5 distance from each other. So if you're going to be an A here, let's imagine you have A here, you go off the distance. If you're going to be, let's say, the C here, you go off the distance, and so on. But if you are somewhere else in the unit square, you get the exact same properties. So this is the fractals. Being funny. Is there a problem with this presentation? No, 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 no. I think it's the camera, but go on. Oh, it's yeah. Easy. So we are seeing quite well. The, mm -hmm. the computer, in fact, yeah. So I'll just quickly move to is that in here I will use my hands, it's easier. Is that if two sequences are moving towards the same edges, you can imagine there is an edge here in the, in the cup and another one in the, in the computer. If two things are moving together, they'll be moving around together and closer, closer, and closer. If they don't share the same absolute height, they go 0 0.5, at least 0 0.5 or close to 0 0.5 somewhere else. And then we have all these positions away from each other. Which means that whatever matrix we'll come to, we'll come up with, they'll have something to do with the maximum distance between these positions. Now at the time, and Susanna remembers this well, I think, we took many wrong turns. So we'll take some wrong turns. A wrong turn here is that you say, Whatever, let's go with the distance anyway. Let's not try to do something that maps the fractal nature of this space, but just impose something we are familiar with. And you can still discover things, which is what we do here, but eventually you hit a roadblock. And I think that's what we saw in the SND, is that they gave this presentation where in the end they were back to Goldman's objections. So they were back in frequency space. And I understand that that's where people feel comfortable until you start coding. When you start coding, you see the advantages of the fractal spaces much faster and you can do funny things. So here we go. So here you have serenine B and serenine A. I'm aligning one with a line. I'm not aligning, I'm just counting the, uh, measuring the distance using uh, Euclidean distance on the maximum distance. And you see here two sequences, so turning B and turning A. So they are coming down here, going to the left, from the left to the right here. And you see, as they have the same sequence here, they converge until they are very close together. So one minus the distance, so one minus the correlation, you get the distance. And you see the same thing here. And you could even find out, so this is 
one, two, three, four. Anyway, you know, the last three before the last are converging. And we'll see it here somewhere. Oh, it's down here. See here? Six, seven, eight. One, two, three. One, two, three. Okay, last thing. Okay, now this is actually a reminder that Susanna has explored the uh, information theory component of this. Uh, I only approach it very briefly to satisfy a question that drove me to the field. I read the physics paper saying that procurement genomes are random, and I thought this came up with people. I hope I always find training since that show me not random. It's actually that largely drove a lot of what we did was just these guys are wrong and we are going to write and just saying that biology has a lot of structure. It turns out they were right. So they're not right at the lower nucleotide or oligomer length because of this business of having restriction enzymes that move away from DNA. But once you go past the, the diet trinucleotide, restriction enzymes are not looking for longer patterns. And then whatever is left in this succession space, prokaryotic genomes use it to the fullest. So when you have a, a, a test in English, let's say, and you zip it, the zip version of the English text is very close to uh, random. That's what the compression does. The compression makes things random, and hopefully there's a, a code, uh, sorry, a key, that allows you to decode the compressed state. Same thing for prokaryotes. Those of you from biology will remember there are some genes that are coded in one direction, and another gene is coded in the other direction. So they overlap, but somehow, like these Sufi poets from the ages, they would write a poem on both sides of the sentence. So you would, you would read the stanza going forward and other stanzas going backwards. So it takes a lifetime to write these uh, sequences, and it takes, I guess, potentially a, a billion or a couple of billion years to do it in biology, but eventually get that level of conversion. So to make this more clear, this is from the paper at the time. I was very surprised to find these things out. So for example, the theory in a gene analyzed above as an average sequence of A, T, G, 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 T, T, etc. And the question is, what is an average sequence? You know, it's not something that is immediately obvious. It has a median sequence of T, G, G, T, A, T, G, etc. Again, what is a median sequence? That's even more repeat because you don't have a succession of sequences and repeat the one in the middle. So what we are doing here is benefiting from having this bijective map truly to a metric space. And whenever we need to do math, we go to the numeric space. So I'm just calling it numeric in the sense that there is a metric space. And then we map it back, uh, we do the calculations, and we map it back to the sequence space. This can be done with any sequence. And that was the next question. Can we generalize the USM approach? And I'll go into the details of what USM is, and I'll give you a link where you can, where you can put your own sequences and, and see them going on. So the question is, can we do this for other uh, alphabets? And so is an example in English. So this is a poem by uh, Wendy Cove. I am a poet, I'm very fond of bananas, and it goes on and on and on. I am a very fond of bananas, and I am a poet. So she plays with these sorts of patterns. Why am I using a poem here is that if I say C, G, T, T, C, C, you won't remember. If I say bananas, you know, yeah, bananas, we recognize. Also, you quickly recognize the information content of these segments. For instance, bananas is kind of repetitive. So you can definitely compress bananas into something shorter. But for instance, I am a poet, it could be a lot harder. So I'm going to pick the first and last sentence and play the same game. So the first, the last. And I'm going to walk you through the algorithm used for any alphabet, it doesn't matter. So the first thing is to identify the new sequences. For these two standards, you have empty space, a dot, a question mark, and then the letters. And what you do is that you generate the binary code, and you define a space set, in this case, at five dimensions. So you find out you need five dimensions to represent the English, at least the English used in this poem. And each of them represents an edge. So now imagine this is an hypercube unit in all directions. And if you, this is called the compact USM encoding method. You can also do this parcel. You could say, no, I'm going to do like in AI, we do one hot encoding. I'm just going to have one zero 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 one zero 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 one zero that sort of thing. And trust me, if you don't trust me, just raise your hand and say, I'm not sure if that's true. The result is exactly the same, makes no difference. So the order of edges or the compactness of the uh, encoding makes no difference in the metric. It's, it's all the same. So you do this, in this case, you have 19. And now I'm going to do this. So this is the method. I get to the number, in this case, 5. 
which means if you cut a few letters, it will make it to four. So, you know, we have somewhere in the middle, but you need something you can fill, so it's five. Okay. So let's do this now. So I am a poet. I am very fond of bananas. And these are the corresponding edges. Okay, so let's see this part. It's easier if you see it. Actually, it's kind of like that. So the CGI procedure is applied to each axis. It doesn't matter how many axes you have, so how many, they will have like to be orthogonal. So if you have a space, a hyperdimensional space of dimension five, that's it, there are five dimensions in the resulting coordinates. So I am a very poet, I'm very fond of bananas. These are the encoding values, in both directions. So I'm playing the game half, middle, 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 middle. Sorry, half, 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 sorry, to the right edge. And I keep playing this until I get to the end. When you get to the end, you have your five coordinates for each of the directions. So let's pick, for example, this one. Notice where you are. You're right there to A, I am. And you're, this is being encoded downwards and upwards in both directions. And they also have these coordinates of that position. Now, we throw, this is the part where the scientists in you say, OK, to know it was more, and it's going to get interesting. If I give you these coordinates, these two coordinates, just give them to you, you know all you need to compare this sequence at the position with any other sequence. So you can now move this away, make the most of your GPUs. So these are now all the three operations. You can apply, there's no dynamic programming, nothing. So let's do it. So I'm going to pick these, and I'm going to do the fragmentation by unfolding the USM space. And I find out which edges this thing comes from. So this is the forward one. I know they come this way. Let's find out. Yeah, I am a poet. I Remember, we stopped in the A. Now go back here. No, okay. I am very fond of the name. So now I can do usual things. Just I hate to see it, by the way, I'm only showing you, but <laughs> I prefer computing and stuff using AI and coding. It's much nicer. So this uh, uh, hyper sp uh, dimensional spaces come to life when you're not forced into a PCI, I'm like, I'm not sure if I'm building one as a pet peeve. But in any case, you recognize even in something as stiff as PCI, you find that very fond that and bananas, they dock. So now you're doing docking with sequences in this way. They are docking, for instance, here, all over the place, very fond of, whereas banana repeats itself, it's in a little corner. So this idea of the first principal component representing as much variance as possible, and then the second doing the same in the residuals and keep going, you see them that the information content of the docking is very much retained. So you can play all sorts of games on this. This is just recalling the metric. And already you know what this is about. So we're doing matrix distances on the maximum distance in any direction. So here I always like to take a little pause. So remember, we are now we are heading in the wrong direction. We know that the distance metric has something to do with the maximum difference between two sequences, but we are using a metric that is not a good one. Why? Because if you throw a dart on this unit square, and then you throw another one that pops up close to the first one, you have no guarantee that they are similar. You make your darts land it right at the edge between two quadrants, and then these are completely different sequences. And if this quadrant is the main one, this is an error at the nucleotide level. If it's in the sub-quadrant, it's at the second element of the nucleotide. But in spite of this, just random, if you're just throwing darts, uh, you're more likely to be similar to another sequence if you're close to it in using the Euclidean metric, right? You're not guaranteed to be similar, but you're more likely to be similar. What you know is that if you're far apart, you are different. So what I did here now using a color scheme is play these two sequences. And again, no, it makes no difference if you're using amino acids, nucleotides, or, or, or letters. I'm just using something you can recognize, like bananas. And you see the same effect. Things converge, 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 and they become very similar at the end. So bananas. And you see bananas here, right? So I'm aligning bananas with bananas without doing that with programming. You're free. And if you want to look at the numbers again, here they are. You see them here, like this yellow thing here. Four, five, six, eight, and so on. Now the same thing backwards. So forward, back, forward, back. No, I think at this point, we are about to have a, a, a 
Jeffrey moment where we find something we didn't expect. So that goes forward, right? Okay, ignore this, just putting it together and finding out what errors we are making. I should have removed this song, sorry. So what you have here is the function that tells you the distribution of errors if you throw darts randomly for different alphabets. So I believe this one is, one of them is Chinese, it's somewhere, it's one. But so you have all sorts of languages, and for each of them, this is just basic trigonometry, you find out what is the distribution of errors if you just throw darts in the pen. Okay. Let's see more of this. Now let's go back to our game forward. Denoise. So I go to that function, that distribution, and I remove the likely error, and what you get is something that is cleaner. That's it. But then there's still a probability that you uh, assign similarity to things that aren't similar. Okay, now backward. Okay. So I'm going to do it slowly. So forward. And I stop, so you want to see. Okay, what is this conversion? I am a point. Okay. Yeah, I am a point. See. Very fun. It's very fun here. Yeah, there it is. And you see here the convergence. Backward. All together. So for me, this was a shock. <laughs> And look at the columns. So if you count the squares, you see here. So for when you compare coordinates of a position between two sequences, just having the coordinates, you throw everything else away. You know what is the length of the single segment. I was very simple about this. Now this is after the noise, it's clear. And this is what the point where I say I will not touch on, on information content from now on because Susanna will at some point tell us about this. Well, not today. <laughs> so what I'll do now is I want to show you this thing in action. So this is from paper. Paper is here. So you know, try to make reduce the comp So make reduce plays a big role in, in bioinformatics. As I understand the reason why we were able to do shotgun sequencing is because the map that is that's in the Makena pipe is right in the Python. So I'm not going to go into MapReduce unless someone wants to know. It's part of the free operation that can be paralyzed by the interpreter. So it's super, super fast. Yes, no? Okay. Okay. Anyone else, you know, if you now, I want to know about this. So I'm going to pick in, which, put, by the way, we could have picked the times, no problem. It is. I'm going to do this for English so you see it in practice. So you have here a sequence. I am a poet, I am, etc. And you see here, if you know these two coordinates, and you know, so it's here, and you know these two coordinates in each direction, by just looking at the the values of the coordinates, you know they share a similar segment of length 3. It's small, I can see it says color. See here, for instance, 19. 19 is about I am very fond of bananas, which I can see as well, very fond of bananas. But you just need coordinates for this position, O here, this coordinate, and for this other O here, and you know exactly that they, they are in a 19 subsegment long identity. And there it is, and you can do the map reduce. So, map you can do things like so you apply order free operations to an input item, reduce your you have more than one input item, say two, and for instance, you're adding things together. So, map reduce is great for work on any of the final ones. So, I go back to the presentation. Questions? So, you know, magic land, right? I at least that's how I felt. So it's <laughs> point. You know, work is just a mess. Then you, you are not going to be surprised by finding out that there are all sorts of funny properties that the information theory, that the information theory can provide into this, this conversation. And so then I wrote quite a few papers on this. At the end, the last slide is the list of publications. We have both our names. So maybe I'll list all the papers you wrote without me and vice versa on the specific topic of sequencing. So this is a common a misstep. We took it ourselves, we wrote a paper on it. 
which is when you, you have all these points and you, you go parsing, or you don't go parsing because it's not a parsing kernel, but you go kernel on this space. So what it means that you go to uh, quadrants and you have some sort of tail, so you define a little hat, you put a hat on top of each point and this generates a distribution. So this is a kernel method to create an SAP distribution and you get this. And then at the time where we were doing this, AI was becoming popular. And the kids, sorry, kids, but the previous <laughs> generation, they were, for them it was so easy to train AI models that they just ran with this. And I'll show you an example as we go on, where people just run, they go to proteins, and do whatever. There's nothing wrong with that, you know, that's a good way actually to get closer to generative AI models, as long as you don't forget that you artificially divided this space in quadrants. You chose to divide in quadrants, because you were tired of numbers. It says, these numbers are becoming funny, I don't, they're having trouble, my dimensional spaces are fun, but I like to provide something to an AI engine that doesn't ask me any questions. So for instance, if you go to Google, uh, you can use um, AutoML. So these are services, you don't even have to have a computer yourself, you can do it from your cell phone. You provide a bunch of images, the labels, and then the topology of the neural network is optimized by the engine, so it includes hyperparameter optimization, changing the sizes, how many units in each layer, and so on. So you just click on the button, you go for a coffee, come back, and you get a model. All right, so I promise kissing games is one. This is my one. All kissing games with flags. So this is kind of interlude now, unless you say, no, we have to tie it already. No? No, okay. All right, so Anders Fieser. He wrote a paper showing that chaos again, he was interested in proteins, not in the You can put in the presentation also. Oh. So I'm going to show three examples. Kissing there. So this kissing is between the flakes. So the flakes are enclosed by a circle. And this is solution is to do what Andras Fisa does, is that I'm just going to define a circle and see the circles have to touch each other. And you get the specific triangle. The funny thing is that you got you get nothing else kissing. There is no more kissing after this. <laughs> so here they are just next to each other, but see the edges now here. You see, you have to push the bubbles closer together in order for kissing to happen. So kissing is touching between the edges of of, of like some of the to begin. Uh, we took this as a challenge, most of you remember, this is an at the time. I know there were these papers coming out, how should you put oranges in a box? Maybe this is from S. So you put oranges out, they should fit. And we thought, well, there should be a solution for this. Uh, it, it's pure trigonometry. It took me a whole day, you know, the piece of paper went back and forth until the things matched and then it was working. Now, recently, Anna Lockham, she's very interested in Martin, she did something that we didn't expect, which is she's a mathematician. So she knew about this hacking stuff from a long time ago. And for her, it just took her to go to the monthly magazine of mathematicians and found the issue <laughs> where. So what I'm trying to say here is that, we find it's interesting, especially the younger ones, is that often, like Sidney Brenner uh, told us about, having a method allows us to see something we couldn't see before. We couldn't see beyond trigonometry. Because MathCAD at the time, so you use MathCAD in MATLAB, the symbolic engines, or even Wolfram at the time, they were not good enough to simplify these equations. But in fact, this equation is very simple. Very good. So this is ours. This is Anna, Fieser and all, talking about the universes of Anders Fieser, proposing an equation to calculate the kissing of, so I didn't come up with kissing games, they did. And it's not suitable for four vertices and good on and So if you impose this on the square, and you describe the squares inside of a circle, you see that there's no kissing, except in the 20 feet places. But there are no flakes in these regular space positions, so there's no kissing. There's just the bubbles against each other. So in the American Math Monthly, <laughs> by a guy called Robert Schwitzarts, no idea, they have come up with the simplification of this equation into this. So, so it's fine. So, I already mentioned a few review papers, so if you're curious about the field, Canon makes a wonderful uh, review of the field. 
accepted in the end-to-end she jumps to AI, which she did here, so deep learning on chaos in representation. She uses the 2D torturing of the USM space. So with this in mind, I'm going to walk back and see if this makes sense. This is the game we've been playing so before. If you just have to think zero one, you can do everything we talked about, calculate information content, calculate distances, and so on, by using the single dimension. This would be zero one, A B, one out hold. With three. And you see here the the do keys, the circles keys right at the edge of the flex. So this is it right. So I'm moving half the distance. Now four. So four is the lucky of the dice of the universal living that you have a uniformly filled space. It will not happen again. So it doesn't matter how many dimensions you have, you will never have again a space that is uniformly filled at two dimensions, only four. So for each dimensional space, there is a perfect match, and you shouldn't try to torture it, but of course you need. So this is a solution of the same game. For instance, if you're playing this game with no multiple squares, they could only touch here, see, here, here, so they will touch each other. So here, so it's our, our solution at the time. We are able to push them forward without breaking by jacket spaces. But it's what you say, okay, you're just playing with figures, which is completely true. You should be doing this in the hyperdimensional space, which is completely accurate. So the fact that now there is a tradition emerging, but people just get the 2D projection of the character representation of something, and then they do AI on it, just because they are spoiled. I mean, we are spoiled. We go to Google Auto ML, we do convolution neural networks, we spin out how many thousands of machines they do, we go for a coffee, and the only difference is not how long it takes you to get the coffee and walk back, is how many machines Google is spinning to try all these possible topologies for the neural networks. So it's kind of, I'd say, lazy, right? <laughs> Since when did the new generation got praise from the previous one? Never, right? So, <laughs> So a few years, uh, we go back to Ernest Pepper. Just for curiosity, and you see now it, it can be critic. Now you're familiar with this. Remember, we played the same in the beginning. We played this one. This is Jeffrey. The kissing. All solved. Then it's a much simpler equation. And that's it. So they are now going to do convolution neural networks in a bi-dimensional space, in a planar space that is mostly empty. Nothing happens here, nothing happens here, nothing happens here, and nothing happens here, nothing happens here, and goes on and on and on. So this is a holdout, and the more, the longer the vocabulary, the more holdout this space is. So of course, if you again try two dimensions and you are doing nucleotizing in place, if you are doing amino acids and proteins, you are not. And this is what she did. So, if you can pause here, any questions? Does this make sense? So, the younger ones? <laughs> so only use player representations for the other times. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you'll turn off down your, your main suit. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's continue. So, this is not that serious, of course. So, let's have some time. You already saw this one. You can go there with your, your coordinates. If you go here, So all of this is online, you don't, you don't need to install anything. Do I have a problem? Yes, I do. It's loading the sequence. Oh, this is not good. Okay, I'm going to connect my DKM just to make sure. It's, this is the perfect moment right where you can see how people work and then things break right down. Let's 
starting my circles. No, two things work. All right, so it is like I remember. Yay! <laughs> so this is always risky. Yeah, I always like this moment when it's someone's presentation, not mine, <laughs> because you suddenly find out how they work and what libraries they use. Sorry, I use the curious. This is the IDE that the web browser gives you every day. You can edit your code, you can debug it. You can also compile from other languages into the browser environment using something called Wasm. And uh, so if you're about that, all right. So I control the machine. So I have here an example where you go back to Jeffrey. See, this is Jeffrey's approach. Stuck in the middle is the one this persistent triangle was used. So if I put non type, see here. So we have this is no moving touch in just barely on cut to the on the generative AI model. So you have this space here that you're filling by jumping half the distance to the next edge, and I only have no types. So see here. I encourage you to go to usm.pitab.io for slash fold. Um, is anyone doing it? So if I'm going to be all this. It should be obsessed. Okay. But it should be working. Um, so any questions about this? Up? Look forward, backward. So you can imagine a string, and you have these two pointers moving, but with different tails. So one of them has a tail to the left, to the past. And the other one is a tell to the future by adding the encoded in reverse way. So now you have these two coordinates, forward and backward, going together. And this is how you obtain them. So I'm going to go back to the beginning. So, so you may remember that we had problems with the algebra of this space because if you had actually, let's put something bigger. Because if I have a bunch of A's, A, 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 of course, in both spaces, you are getting close to the edge, right? But if you just have A or a bunch of A's, you would be there. This made no sense. And there were features that emerged from the fact that in the beginning of the chaos game, you were starting in the middle, not still becoming person. So one possible solution, and I have a slide where I show this, so there will be the example, and then we'll go back to, the, to this slide here. So if I now put circular, it moves to the edge. So I'm going to do it no gently. A, C, G, something is there. And what you see is that, so green is the beginning of the sequence, red is the end, is that when you get to the end, you can calculate the beginning by going half the distance to the edge of the beginning. And you're already guessing, well, this is a complicated process. It says no exact solution. It means that I'm going in circles until the value don't change. And it's computational not as impressive as you can imagine because these changes have a memory, a finite memory, and say after 32 units, there is no memory at the beginning. So you spend a, little, a few cycles in the beginning made, made, making sure you converge the values, and then this works just fine. Now, the problem is that unless you're working with plasmids or viruses, you're probably not working with uh, circular genomes. So you're treating the genome as if it was circular, but it's not. So you're going to create some other artifact for sure. It's going to be a gentler artifact than starting in the one position that never happens. There is no sequence where you hit again 0 0.5, 0 0.5. You know, it's an American possibility. And so that feature is not gone. But we have other features associated with this forced looping. So now I'll move to the new one. I'm not sure if you're familiar with this one, the bidirectional one. So the bi bidirectional one is a little bit harder to explain. Or oh, by the way, you saw with the circular, it's true in both directions, right? So C, G, G. So see here, this is the beginning, this is the end. After this is to A. Same thing here, but in reverse. Now it's T at the end, A in the beginning, after this is to B. So it's over the second. So here something else is happening is that we are jumping from one tail to the other. And this one is just harder to see the jump. So what it means is that instead of looking here, you look here, see, it becomes harder. 
and let's set over here to look here. So back to the slides in a second. So the other thing I wanted to, for you to notice is that I'm going to reload this. So you see the time it takes to do. Struggle, oh, sorry. So I'm looking at the quarter million nucleotides of the EGFR. So it's an oncogenes and the level growth factor is very important in cancer research. I'm getting the sequence directly from NCBI and I'm populating this space. Notice the, the speed. I mean, in spite of the time it takes, so, so you can see this, I'm going to give some color, and I'm going to change the number of quadrants. So every time I change the number of quadrants, this thing is going to change size by remapping the coordinates. So go back to the and rebins re them. So I'm going to start with something small, which is just one of the tides. You can't see, it's just individual pixels. And now let's see the crystal. So really, we have like the crystal it says ground, ground. So every time I click right, the quarter million coordinates in both directions is binned. Every time, so I'm not zooming in. This is not a zoom in, this is letting the crystal grow. So the crystal is growing. And this is the length of the segment being resolved, 5.7 of the time at this point. You know, when you get to 11, you're at the size of the genome of E. coli. I think for the GFR, it was 5 as 10. Yeah, so. so now you see the features grow. So just by looking at the features, this is a big square. You immediately see the quadrant, it's part of so the square here. It's immediately at the dinotype level. So you can immediately recognize it, and then others. If you spend a couple of minutes looking at this, you conclude that they are symmetrical. If you spend five minutes instead of a couple of minutes, you find out they are not. So it's the difference between the similarity. They appear symmetrical, but they are only symmetrical when they are identical. So this is the difference. You're seeing a, a visual impression of that space. All right. Just going to move to the mapping so you see what happens. So now you have 10, yeah. So we have one nucleotide away from the resolution that being E. coli. And you see now that you have to zoom in and you find out that there are individual combinations that happen a lot. Something to do with A and T. Yeah, you see the diagonal here? All the way to A. So there's something here that is completely red. This is a scalar sample from the mean to the maximum. All right, no questions? So remember, it's in the, I gave you the URL, play with it as much as you want. It's all running in your web browser. So I'm not, you're not owing me any favors. It's just to call my rescue your mission. So we play with this. Um, okay, so USM should take a pause here. So. If you want to run code by moving the code to where the data is, at MCI, for reasons I'll touch in the last slide, we have moved everything to the web. When I say to the web, it's to web computing. It only happens inside the browser. If you need a cluster, we have something called WebRTC, doing peer-to-peer -peer communication between the members of the cluster. You could say, yeah, that's fantastic. You know, we've done this some time back, something called Key Machine. But there's another reason to go back. So, this is worth waiting for. Yeah, I can see. So now it, this is also dating the work at the time, 2014. And this idea that you give every collection of web browsers working together, and that something like 10,000 web browsers, you reach the top 500 supercomputers in the planet. No, 10,000 machines you find them in a large hospital. So there's a lot of computation floating around that we need to be able to harvest. And because this is a cancer-related type of research, one of the places where this becomes immediately needed is that we need federated learning to parameterize our models across cohorts. So for me, it's like a lucky thing that we are using web computing, so cost zero volunteer computing, and at the same time, we have full privacy. So I'm going to go back here, making sure, yeah. So I'm just slides back. Still good with time, Susan? Uh, we should close, sort of, but we, okay. or at least give the opportunity to those online uh, to ask, ask questions. So I can just, I can go very quickly, like 30 seconds, so close the question. So this is what we're missing. We already did this, it's just the detailed explanation of what's happening in the three encodings. This is the next explanation where you can go there and, with the, and write 
your impression. So this is what's not being discussed, the same fractal position encoder, distance matrix, there's a new one, now of course using folding. Finally, we let go of this addiction to Euclidean matrix. Uh, using GWAS, so the scalability of these methods allow us to do GWAS in different ways. And we are applying this to polygenic risk, risk calculators. 